big thanks to the organizers for inviting me to give this talk and for planning this exciting conference. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you virtually, and I'm really sorry uh, for not being able to be there in person in, in beautiful Santa Barbara. Um, so, uh, yes, yeah, so I will discuss properties of uh, dual AGNs that uh, eventually become gravitational wave sources and, and merge. And uh, before I start, I will acknowledge my collaborators, uh, Kunyang Lily Lee, uh, who has done a lot of this work as part of her PhD thesis at Georgia Tech, David Ballantyne, as well as uh, Matteo Bonetti. So, uh, dual AGNs at kiloparsec separations, as we heard from uh, Julie's excellent talk before, are our most definitive observational evidence for existence of massive black hole pairs uh, and are also progenitors of uh, massive black hole mergers. And um, this is, of course, because identification, unambiguous identification of uh, massive black hole pairs and binaries at smaller separations is really challenging. So uh, I will describe our recent results uh, that focus on dual AGNs and uh, massive black hole mergers, uh, which was motivated by some of these questions. Um, some dual AGNs will end in massive black hole mergers, but uh, can we figure out which ones uh, will, will do that? How long does it take for individual sources, but also on average for a whole population? Which dynamical processes uh, lead to orbital evolution and are most important for uh, the whole population of uh, massive black hole pairs? And uh, can the incidence then of dual AGNs be used to predict massive black hole coalescence rates and vice versa? Uh, once we have the coalescence rates measured by gravitational wave observatories, can we use that to infer something about uh, um, properties of uh, dual AGNs and the way that they evolve? So we'll start by summarizing uh, the most important ingredients of the calculation uh, that, that we use to tackle these questions. Basically, we started by drawing massive black hole pairs uh, from the uh, TNG 50 uh, simulations. This is a cosmological hydrodynamic simulation, a part of the illustrious TNG, the next generation suite, uh, which has physical volume of about 50 co-moving megaparsecs cubed. And it assumes heavy massive black hole seed formation model, uh, which means that the smallest minimum mass of a black hole that one can find uh, in, in this simulation is uh, about 10 to the 5 solar masses. Uh, there are about 21, 2200 uh, MBH pairs uh, in uh, TNG50, and uh, they all end up with um, a minimum separation of about 1 kiloparsec, which is actually set by the gravitational softening length of, of this uh, simulation. So I just wanted to mention that these black holes um, were identified uh, in the simulations and black hole pairs using the same approach that has been used to extract them from uh, an earlier generation of illustrious simulations and uh, was used in studies by Laura Black and Luke Kelly. So from that point on, from separation of about one um, kiloparsec uh, towards uh, smaller separations, we basically evolved the equations of motion of uh, these massive black hole pairs due to stellar and gas dynamical friction, due to those stellar loss cone scattering, interactions with the circumbinary disk, and due to the emission of gravitational waves uh, using semi-analytic uh, basically calculations and prescriptions, but we do not account for triple and higher order massive black hole interactions in, in this model. So what I'm showing in this histogram here is basically the initial distribution of massive black hole pairs drawn from the uh, TNG50 simulation, where we can see that initially it's a broad distribution that reaches to uh, relatively high redshifts. 
So uh, we model the orbital evolution of massive black hole pairs uh, in a, a remnant galaxy, uh, this is, which is represented by an analytic model. It's a single uh, remnant galaxy that contains a stellar bulge and gas disk. We don't model the stellar disk because we found that uh, in our calculation it doesn't make um, a huge difference whether that's included or not. Um, we model two non-spinning massive black holes. Uh, one is placed at the center of the remnant galaxy, that's the more massive black hole. Uh, the other one, the smaller uh, of the two, is uh, placed uh, in the disk of, of the galaxy. Uh, and um, the entire uh, host galaxy and massive black hole pair are described by seven parameters. Massive black hole, uh, oh, the, the pair mass and mass ratio, and mass and size, or more specifically, half mass radius of the bulge and uh, the gas disk, as well as the rotational velocity of the gas disk. All but the last of these uh, seven parameters were drawn uh, from the TNG 50 cosmological simulation. And for the uh, rotational velocity, we assume it to be somewhere between 70 and 90% of the local circular velocity uh, of the host galaxy. More uh, description about the setup of this calculation uh, can be found in this uh, uh, series of uh, papers uh, starting with, uh, with 2020, and you can also ask me about it, of course. So let's start with the orbital evolution timescales that we found uh, basically by uh, doing this calculation. It's the evolution from kiloparsec separations all the way to merger. Uh, what I'm showing on the left-hand side here, uh, so uh, I want you to focus on the on the panel on the left, is uh, basically histogram of time scales uh, for evolution due to dynamical friction acting on uh, on the pair uh, of massive black holes, and this includes both stellar and gas dynamical friction. Uh, so. What you see here is that the median time scale for evolution due to dynamical friction, when dynamical friction dominates, uh, is on the order of billions of years. It's rather long, and not all um, pairs merge. Uh, the basically hatch portion of the histogram shows which pairs stall and do not merge within a Hubble time. And uh, there is about 33% of those that, that don't merge. I will just say that this histogram contains uh, 8660 uh, massive black hole pairs, which corresponds to the original number drawn from the TNG uh, simulation times four different orbital configurations that we consider, which uh, are basically low or high eccentricity orbits, prograde or retrograde uh, orbits. So, um, Moving to the second histogram to the right, uh, we also can track the evolution time scale uh, for massive black hole pairs once they become gravitationally bound and evolve due to a combination of the stellar loss cone scattering, interactions with the circumbinary disk, and uh, or emission of gravitational waves. Um, the takeaway point here is that those, time, the, uh, those timescales are then shorter compared to the dynamical friction phase, so that when you add up these timescales together, you find the total distribution, which actually looks very much like the dynamical, time scale, dynamical friction uh, timescale histogram, uh, just because uh, those are the longest timescales. So the bottom line here is that for majority of massive black hole pairs that coalesce, the merger timescale is determined by dynamical friction, which means that dynamical friction determines the coalescence rate of the massive black hole binaries. And uh, inverting that statement, basically, if we measure coalescence rate from gravitational wave observations will be able to directly test the efficiency of dynamical friction. Um, from modeling uh, point of view, it means that you can basically calculate the evolution of uh, pairs due to dynamical friction, perhaps neglect the evolution of uh, 
due to these other mechanisms uh, <clears throat> at smaller separations and still obtain a distant estimate of the coalescence rate. Even though in individual cases, you may not know the exact line to the dynamical friction time scale versus the loss cone scattering versus one or the other. Okay, moving on. Uh, let's look at the redshift distribution of uh, these pairs, um, specifically the pairs that merge. On the left-hand side, I'm showing you the histogram that you uh, already saw a couple of slides back. This is the initial distribution, relatively wide, reaching all the way uh, to redshift of six, because it takes billions of years for pairs to evolve from kiloparsec scales to merger. When you actually look at the distribution uh, of pairs uh, over redshift at merger, uh, that distribution is uh, shifted towards lower redshifts. And um, that actually is a good news for the electromagnetic uh, follow-up of gravitational wave events, because uh, at these redshifts, uh, which are low to moderate, we have better chances of detecting sources electromagnetically. Um, the analysis that uh, we've done in terms of the prograde and retrograde uh, um, massive black hole pairs also tells us that when it comes to those that have low eccentricity orbits initially, about 71% of prograde, prograde pairs end up in uh, coalescence uh, versus 39% uh, of retrograde pairs uh, that merge by redshift of zero. So prograde binaries should be more efficient, uh, should merge more efficiently. Okay. So we can also look at the properties of systems that host massive black hole mergers. Uh, so what I'm showing here, uh, again on the left, uh, is the coalescence fraction as a function of the gas fraction of the host galaxy, where coalescence fraction is basically the number of pairs that eventually coalesce over the total number of pairs initially, and gas fraction is defined as the uh, total gas mass within the galaxy divided by total stellar plus gas mass. And what you see here is regardless of whether the orbit is prograde or retrograde, uh, basically the highest coalescence fraction corresponds to systems with the largest gas fraction, gas fraction larger than 60%. And that is telling us that in these systems, gases dynamical friction plays a very important role uh, in basically the evolution, orbital evolution of these pairs. The second panel uh, shows coalescence fraction as a function of the mass of the primary black hole. And you can see, uh, again, that uh, the coalescence fraction is highest for relatively low mass primaries uh, on this scale that I'm showing. And this reflects the fact that lower mass galaxies that host lower mass black holes tend to have highest gas fractions in the TNG-50 cosmological simulation. So this is just uh, a different face of the same coin uh, that is telling us that gas dynamical friction is important. Uh, looking at the last panel on the right, I'm showing basically the coalescence fraction versus the mass ratio of uh, the, the massive uh, black hole pair. And um, what you can see here is that coalescence fraction is actually highest for pairs with a higher or, or relatively high um, mass ratio and therefore comparable black holes, uh, which is not surprising because uh, if both uh, the uh, the primary and the secondary are of a comparable mass, then dynamical friction will be um, most efficient relative to unequal mass pairs. And it will basically, either stellar or gas dynamical friction, it will act to bring the two black holes together on a shorter time scale. In all cases, prograde orbits tend to be, um, or prograde pairs tend to uh, evolve to merger been more efficiently than the retrograde pairs. Okay, so using these ingredients, 
uh, we were able to calculate uh, massive uh, black hole merger rate and to also infer the uh, detection rate for the Lisa gravitational wave observatory. And uh, what I'm showing in these panels are basically rates for prograde low eccentricity massive black hole pairs and binaries. Uh, the, the conclusion doesn't change much for other orbital configurations. What changes is the normalization of uh, basically the, the scales that I'm showing in, in these panels, but the distribution uh, doesn't. Okay, so what's in the panels? Uh, on the left-hand side, what you see is uh, how the differential coalescence rates that is shown next to the color bar there depends on the binary mass and the redshift of the coalescence. Differential coalescence rate is shown as a number per unit d log mass of the binary interval, dz and dt, multiplied by four years, which we assume is the nominal lifetime of the least gravitational wave observatory. Okay, so the color traces the cosmological merger rate of uh, massive black hole pairs uh, in, in the simulation. Uh, the uh, contours trace the signal to noise ratio calculated for detections of, uh, of these events by LISA. And uh, signal to noise ratio of eight, it's kind of a threshold that um, is commonly used. Uh, higher signal to noise ratio events are considered detected by LISA, lower one uh, signal to noise ratios um, mean that the source is not detected in gravitational waves. So what you can see basically is that uh, the highest coalescence rate occurs around the redshift of 1.6 uh, or, or so between the redshift of 1 and 2 and corresponds to relatively low um, massive black hole binary masses. Uh, again, because these live, uh, tend to live in gas-rich galaxies and evolve efficiently to coalescence. And the uh, contours uh, of the signal to noise ratio tell you that um, LISA should be able, in this case, to detect a bulk of the coalescences in the universe because they sit in, in uh, the observatory's sweet spot here. The second panel tells you a similar story, but about the uh, total mass of the binary and uh, mass ratio. Again, the highest uh, coalescence rate occurs at low uh, binary mass, high, relatively high mass ratio. And um, in, in this case, too, Lisa should be able to observe a majority of them with signal to noise ratio 100 or even higher. And uh, the last panel shows uh, the same coalescence rate as a function of the mass of the stellar bulge versus the gas fraction of the uh, remnant galaxy. And uh, what you can see here is that uh, coalescence rates are highest for relatively low mass bulges and relatively high gas fractions. Um, again, uh, they would be within the bounds of the uh, Lisa signal towards ratio of eight. Okay, so integrating those uh, differential um, merger rates basically gives us a cosmological merger rate of about 0 0.5 per year and a Lisa detection rate, which is comparable, but just slightly lower, uh, about 0 0.3 per year. But there are some cautionary remarks that I would like to make. Uh, this is a lower limit on the LISA detection rate because, as I mentioned before, um, TNG50 uh, basically considers massive black holes with mass higher than 10 to the 5 solar masses, and uh, LISA gravitational wave observatory will, of course, be able to detect coalescences of even lower mass black holes, 10 to the 3 and 10 to the 4 solar masses. Uh, our calculation does not capture those. A cautionary remark number two is that this calculation that I presented uh, neglected the effect of um, radiative feedback from an accreting massive black hole, from both massive black holes, in calculation of the dynamical friction, which I mentioned to you is the, the 
uh, most important mechanism, uh, dynamical mechanism for orbital evolution. And uh, we'll see in a moment that that effect can actually be important. Okay, well, now we can also uh, ask uh, from our model, what are the pro uh, properties of precursor dual active galactic nuclei that will eventually become Lisa sources? And in order to do that, we define this theoretical property, which we call electromagnetic detectability, uh, which in, uh, contains within this integral uh, an instantaneous separation of uh, the massive black hole pair. Uh, because if you, for example, wish to image a dual AGN, it will be easier to image those that are uh, that have wider separations than those that have smaller separations. Uh, the ratio between uh, the luminosities of the smaller and bigger uh, black hole, because uh, dual AGNs which have comparable uh, luminosities will be easier to identify as duals, uh, as opposed to those that have very disparate. Uh, luminosities. And of course, uh, luminosity distance or redshift to the source will um, matter as well, uh, with sources uh, detected at, with, uh, at lower redshift being easier to detect. So overall, the higher D, uh, the higher the, this uh, detectability factor, the easier uh, should be to observe or at least image a dual AGM. So what's shown in the left panel here uh, with color is basically this uh, detectability factor, electromagnetic detectability factor D, and uh, over uh, plotted are contours of LISA signal to noise ratio. So what you can see here that when it comes to the binary mass versus the redshift of coalescence that uh, sources there easiest to, to detect electromagnetically, sit in this bottom left corner uh, of the plot, and generally at low redshift, not surprisingly. Uh, and uh, those overlap very nicely with uh, basically uh, sources with those systems that will eventually merge and become uh, gravitational wave sources for, for LISA. On the right hand side, uh, you see the same um, properties plotted as a function of uh, binary mass and uh, mass ratio. So again, the lower uh, binaries with lower mass and the high mass ratio should then be easier to image as dual AGM uh, on, on the sky. And they also very nicely correspond to these uh, gravitational wave sources with basically very high signal-to-noise ratio. Okay, now going back to this point of the importance of radiative feedback from an accreting massive, uh, accreting massive black, hole, black holes in this pair, uh, we basically studied the effect that radiative feedback has on gases dynamical friction a couple of years back, and it's interesting that we actually also discussed that in, in one of the past uh, KTP programs. Uh, so what I'm showing you here are, are two animations uh, side by side from two dimensional radiation hydrodynamic uh, simulations of million solar mass black hole that is moving through a uniform neutral, uh, initially neutral background medium. And uh, what you see on the left hand side is a um, animation of number density that initially starts as, at one particle per centimeter cubed. On the right hand side is the temperature of the gas that initially starts as uh, at 10 to the 4. And this is basically a black hole that is moving through this medium with a Mach number of 2.7. The size of the box is about 1.6 kiloparsecs. So what you see here is that the very instant when black hole starts accreting uh, and radiation starts emanating uh, from the uh, uh, central region, the accretion uh, flow around the black hole, uh, radiation basically creates this tear-shaped region uh, of low density and high temperature, basically an ionized H2 region. 
uh, that is of a size of about one kiloparsec in this particular case for this Mach number. What is important to, to mention is that if you actually calculate the effect of dynamical friction, dynamical friction force, in the absence of this radiative feedback, you would uh, find that most of the dynamical friction force is contributed uh, from a relatively small region around the massive black hole of the size of one to 10 parsecs or so. You can see here that um, this wake evacuation effect you know, that we're seeing in animations is creating a relatively large um, H2 region that is very likely, if not guaranteed, to affect the overdense gas wake that is trailing the black massive black hole, and that would, in, a, in the absence of radiative feedback, exert um, breaking force on, on the black hole. This is indeed what we find when we actually calculate uh, the, the force acting on this uh, massive black hole. So I'm showing uh, three snapshots basically from uh, our simulations uh, with, uh, with number density. We measured uh, dynamical friction force in these various cases. Again, the size of, of the panel here is one and a half kiloparsec. And what we find is not only is the uh, overdense wake behind the black hole obliterated by radiation, but as the Mach number uh, increases, say, to, from one to two, we see a, the, the formation of this overdense shell ahead of the black hole. So the direction in which the black hole is moving is marked by the arrow. The black hole itself is at coordinate zero, zero. So what we find is that this dense, dense shell that is leading the, the black hole actually uh, attracts the black hole and it exerts force and accelerates the black hole. So opposite to the classical dynamical friction where black hole should be slowing down due to the effect of gases dynamical friction, we actually find that black holes are accelerating and that the force exerted by this uh, overdense front is um, substantial. We measured from, from 2D simulations, we measure it to be 60% of the dynamical friction force in the absence of radiative feedback. Okay, well, but that doesn't go on forever. Of course, uh, black hole will not be accelerated forever. Basically, uh, it only happens when the Mach number of the black hole is less than four. So you can see that in the criterion that I showed before. And this just follows from, from jump conditions. Uh, when the Mach number uh, of the black hole is higher than four, this uh, overdense front is destabilized and um, it falls apart. So then the, the black hole is back to the bombi hoyle littleton uh, accretion setup and the classical dynamical friction is restored. The second criterion is basically telling you that uh, for a certain black hole mass uh, and uh, number density of the ambient gas, if they're below some threshold, then uh, um, basically negative dynamical friction as this effect was dubbed, will affect uh, the orbital evolution of the black hole. So it will be accelerated. And the second condition uh, basically results, what, what it corresponds to is the fact that the size of the H2 region around the black hole is larger than the Bondi radius of the black hole, radius gravitational uh, influence of the black hole. So if that is the case, then uh, basically there will there will be this low density bubble. What I want to point out from this inequality, if you, uh, if you see um, that it implies that negative dynamical friction more strongly affects lower mass or massive black holes. Uh, and because they will more easily satisfy this inequality and therefore be in the negative dynamical friction regime. And those are precisely the ones that are of interest to um, Lisa. So when we take this uh, result of the simulations, which was, by the way, confirmed in, in subsequent works by Gruzinov and Toyochi, in, when we take this into account and fold it into our calculations, we recalculate uh, massive black hole merger and uh, laser detection rates in the presence of radiative feedback. This is what we get. 
So on the left, um, you see basically the coalescence rates, again, represented by the color, cosmological coalescence rates, and Lisa signal to noise ratio curves uh, as a function of binary mass and coalescence redshift. You see that bu the bulk of coalescences now happen at relatively high uh, binary masses and uh, moderate, still moderate redshift around one to two. Uh, but the, these coalescences now lie outside of Lisa's sweet spot, as indicated by the signal to noise ratio curves of eight and higher. And the reason uh, for, for this is because uh, gases dynamical friction, negative gases dynamical friction affects lower mass black holes. Those will take a very long time or may never merge with their counterparts. And therefore, we are back to relying on stellar dynamical friction to bring together massive black hole pairs and, and drive them towards smaller scales and eventually merger. And in that case, classical dynamical friction is just more effective for more massive perturbers and therefore more massive pairs and binaries. The second panel is uh, telling an equivalent story, but in terms of the binary mass and uh, mass ratio. Uh, mass ratios of uh, close to one or one and a half are still preferred. So comparable mass binaries will still have easier time evolving towards the merger, but uh, they will have a higher mass than in the absence of radiative feedback. And uh, the last panel shows uh, the same properties in terms of this uh, mass of the stellar bulge and ga uh, gas fraction of the remnant galaxy. And in this case, too, uh, you can see that um, in majority, well, there, there will be um, majority of coalescences should happen in uh, more massive stellar bulges and at, uh, galaxies with relatively low gas fraction, which basically means in galaxies that will not be affected by negative dynamical friction. Okay, so when we integrate all the rates, what we find is that the merger, cosmological merger rate drops due to basically the effect of negative uh, dynamical friction to 0 0.1 uh, per year, but Lisa detection rate really plummets now because all uh, or most mergers are now happening at higher masses than Lisa can detect. Uh, this rate, uh, I should caution again, this rate is uh, rather alarmingly low for, for LISA uh, because it implies less than one source detected per year. Uh, but again, uh, this is just a lower limit because we do not capture the evolution of uh, massive black hole pairs with mass less than a few times 10 to the five solar masses. Just to remind you, what we had in the absence of radiative feedback, or when, when uh, radiative feedback was neglected, was a uh, massive black hole merger rate of 0 0.45 per year, and these are detection rate, which was slightly lower, but comparable. An important thing to, to, to do, because all these models have underlying assumptions, and so do the cosmologic level hydrodynamic simulations that are used uh, as, a, as a starting point for, for these semi-analytic models, it is very important to compare to, to other works to just understand uh, how different are the results given all these different assumptions and, and ingredients. And uh, what we find is actually that the rates that we predict are within a factor of two or three from say the rates based on um, massive black hole pairs drawn from the Eagle simulation, from the Illustre simulation, or from the Horizon AGN uh, simulation more, more, most recently, which is comforting because it gives us some idea of what the uncertainties are given those theoretical approaches. So in, um, in summary, dual AGNs actually remain the most explicit observational evidence uh, for massive black hole pairs, those at kiloparsec separations. 
uh, and because they're a parent population of uh, merging massive black hole binaries, they're uh, important um, for gravitational wave detections. We can use them to infer the massive black hole coalescence rate from theory uh, and observations. Um, we can do it from theory by modeling, and then we can apply those uh, probabilistic expectations to basically dual AGNs found in observations to infer the, the coalescence rate. Uh, for a population of massive black hole pairs that coalesce within the Hubble time, we find that dynamical friction is the most important mechanism that determines their merger rate. And therefore, by uh, measuring the coalescence rate from gravitational waves, we'll be able to directly test the efficiency of dynamical friction, which to, to this day is a theoretical concept and to my knowledge has not been tested through observations. We find that uh, in calculations that neglect uh, radiative feedback, the merger rate is on the order of 0.5 per year. The laser detection rate is about 0.3, and most mergers originate from binary systems with mass of 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 7 solar masses and moderate redshifts. Uh, and they have actually a relatively high signal to noise ratio um, of about 100 or more. In the presence of radiative feedback from accreting black holes, we find a striking reduction of massive black hole binary coalescence rate by 78% and laser detection rate uh, reduced by 98%. So, and uh, also reduced signal to noise ratio. So it is important, I will say as a conclusion to understand the effect of radiative feedback, these statements are only true to the degree that our still simplified theoretical models capture the salient properties of the effect of radiative feedback on gases dynamical friction. So I will stop there um, and I will welcome uh, your questions at this point. Uh, and uh, if you think of any later, feel free to email me, direct message over Slack or um, send a message uh, to basically day two channel uh, within the Slack created by the organizers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Damara. We're running a little late, but let's try to still have 10 minutes or so of questions. Um, I actually forgot to encourage the people who work on stars to also not be afraid and ask questions in general. Yeah. Um, ciao, Tamara. It's Elena here. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. Um, I, was, uh, I was wondering, uh, what are your thoughts? Uh, what do you think would happen if you include triplets? Uh, uh, I'm asking because <laughs> um, uh, the results from uh, uh, the semi analytical model by Bonetti et al. is that even uh, if the all uh, binary stalls, uh, triplets uh, can merge uh, a substantial fraction of those, uh, giving a rate in LISA which is higher than uh, the one you, uh, you predict. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, what do you think? Um, so you, you're right. Uh, so we did not uh, include uh, interactions by triplets or, or higher order <laughs> massive black hole interactions, but based on uh, the earlier works by Matteo Bonetti, by uh, Luke Kelly and, and some other authors, it seems that cosmological merger rates could be boosted by, I think about 30%, if I uh, remember correctly, uh, or, or thereabout. So the rates indeed could be higher. So I will just stress again, uh, we are placing a lower limit uh, on, on the coalescence uh, rates here. But yes, they, they would be higher. You're right. Thank you. Actually, I do have a quick clarification. I think the conclusion in the Bonetti paper and also a similar paper by our, our group Mm -hmm. was that it's actually very hard to significant. So it's the 30% boost. I don't know what you mean by that. But what we found is that it's actually very hard to reduce the merger rate by stalling because eventually the third black hole does come in and usually mm -hmm. does cause a merger. And moreover, the merger will be at a lower redshift. So it will be higher signal to noise. So in fact, our, our conclusion was kind of optim more optimistic that it's hard to reduce 
the Lisa rate by, well, actually it was just hard to reduce the rate by more than a 50%. Uh, yeah, so that's what I... Even if you stall a lot. <laughs> I mean, that is a good news, but then we should consider whether, let's say, in the presence of negative radiative, or uh, negative dynamical friction, gases dynamical friction, what we should expect then most or all events to evolve through this channel, interaction of uh, yeah. triplets yeah, or, or multiples. Very... And what would that mean for for yeah. a population of uh, yeah, gravitation? I think that's very, very interesting. Okay, Laura? Yeah, uh, yeah so along similar lines, hi, this is Laura Blecka. Um, uh, so, I think tomorrow either I misheard you or you misspoke a couple of times saying that the TNG 50 black holes were uh, a few 10 to the 5 or above, but actually the, the TNG 50 mass is 10 to the 6 is the seed mass, So, and, which I think is really relevant here because the it's, it's 8, 10 to the 5, M sum per H, so about 10 to the 6, um, and which is really relevant here because um, models that go down to lower seed masses, including uh, analysis uh, of the illustrious data uh, and also some analytic models show that, that the Lisa merger rate is dominated by black holes below 10 to the 6 solar masses. So I think, you know, I, I you know, for, for people in the room who aren't like real intimately familiar with this topic, I, I want to try to inject a further note of optimism that, <laughs> you know, the, these rates... Yeah. Um, just because of the limitations of cosmological simulations, we can't probe those lower masses that may, in fact, dominate the merger rate. Um, and sorry, I, I was actually coming around to a question. I'm sorry, I know that's annoying. Uh, if you, did you look at the fraction? Because I'm curious how many of these mergers in the sample were actually at the seed mass, like the merger of two seed mass black holes. So thank you first for for uh, keeping me honest. Uh, I, yeah, uh, I introduced a typo, but what I will say is by looking, uh, say, at this uh, plot here that shows us the cosmological merger rate and laser detection rate, they, uh, a majority actually originate within the range of 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 7 solar masses. So in the absence of uh, radiative feedback in our calculation. So yes, if if so, you would expect LISA detection rate to be greatly boosted once you actually take into account uh, those lower mass systems, lower than million solar masses. And this is confirmed actually by another family of semi-analytic models that don't start necessarily from cosmological simulations, but they seed massive black holes uh, that of arbitrary mass. So they can also see the 10 to the 5, 10 to the 4, 10 to the 3 solar mass uh, black holes in their uh, calculations, semi-analytic calculations. These calculations typically find higher coalescence rates and they have higher predictions for, for LISA rates. But as I said, uh, with what we have, we can only make a prediction for the lower limit and that prediction seems consistent with other works that uh, attempted uh, the same calculation from different cosmological simulations and um, using different methods. Yeah, thank you. I think that uh, point is important. Okay, yeah, thanks. It's important to, to repeat a couple of times because I don't think that things are hopeless, <laughs> even though, uh, Okay, that, there's a question here in the front. Yeah. Uh, Sorry. Yeah, so I just um, wanted to confirm. So since you're starting from cosmological simulations, you aren't including any effects from the nuclear star cluster that might be, right, are you, are you resolving down to like the, the size of the nuclear star cluster and possible tidal effects? Um, that could contribute to accelerating the coalescence? Uh, so, no, certainly not. Uh, basically, once we start the uh, 
semi-analytic modeling below one kiloparsec. And cosmological simulations will include all effects that can be resolved. So I mentioned that for collisionless component, dark matter particles and the, uh, the smoothing length of these simulations is about one kiloparsec. Yeah, right. Uh, I forget what is it for the gas component, but it's probably comparable. So I was just going to basically point folks to another note of optimism. There's a paper by uh, o Ogia, I think, uh, and uh, Han and Mingarelli and, and Voluntary uh, sort of pointing out that the tidal uh, interactions with the nuclear star cluster can actually accelerate the merger of, mm -hmm. of of close by binary supermassive black holes. And of course, nuclear star clusters are also much more likely to be present around lower mass SMBH. And so again, inserting a note of optimism at that at that low mass end and, and yeah. possibly bringing that rate up and obviously also being completely unaffected by radiative feedback since it's just, you know, a collection of stellar particles. Right, right. That is true. Stellar uh, dynamical friction and tidal effects will still play a role. I believe that this effect was also analyzed by Luke Kelly in in his work uh, and some others, uh, Fabio Antonini and uh, collaborators. Uh, indeed, uh, they also found that existence of the stellar cluster, uh, nuclear star cluster, helps up to the point when the nuclear star cluster is dissolved. Right. which eventually happens. Eventually, the nuclear star clusters will be stripped away, so black holes will be more or less bare, uh, evolving in the, um, in the random galaxy. When exactly that happens, uh, the answer is it depends, as with every, every good uh, physics question, but it may happen uh, before they reach separations of uh, one or, or certainly 100 parsecs or so. Okay. So, One kiloparsec. So, uh, <laughs> Sorry. So you know we are kind of into our coffee break. So let's keep maybe a couple more quick ones. Um, first of all, Luke, did you have anything quick to respond to this? Because you're here. Luke is actually here. No, it's okay. Okay. Then uh, is it quick? Hi, Tamara. This is a quick question. It's Steve Taylor. Um, thanks for the excellent talk. I just had a quick question about the LISA detection rate. And are the SNRs conservative here in the sense that? It's only following through to latent spiral, or do you have the merger and ring down in there to to boost the SNR? Uh, thank you, Steve. I didn't mention that, uh, but here is the opportunity. This is only uh, following down to latent spiral, and merger and ring down signal was not accounted for in the calculation of the signal to noise ratio. Good. And uh, thanks. So la last, the last question from Zoom Musumi. <laughs> Uh, hi, hi, thank you for the nice talk. I wanted to ask a very simple question, and that is that um, not all black holes, supermassive black holes are accreting. So when, when you make your estimates, do you figure that in? And also, if they're not accreting, they won't have the radiated feedback. So that will also boost the number and affect your number. Could you make some comments on this? Thank you, that's a good question. And the answer is yes, not all pairs will find themselves in gas-rich galaxies. As I mentioned uh, in the TNG50 cosmological simulations, which is the particular one that we use, uh, lower mass systems correspond to more gas-rich systems. Higher mass systems, higher mass remnant galaxies and higher mass black hole pairs will live in relatively gas poor environments. So they will be either accreting at a lower rate, which may make them um, non-detectable. And it also puts them in the regime where they will not be affected by negative dynamical friction. So yes, in, in other words, that's uh, basically accounted for as, as we inherited from the cosmological simulation. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, thank you again, both Tamara and Julie, for the wonderful talks. Thank you very much. Enjoy the coffee break.